In our examination of the Quran, we have been looking at whether or not it's possible for the Quran and the Bible, for Islam and Christianity to be compatible, uh, to harmonize, to agree with one another. And we've looked at the central doctrine of Christianity, which we see clashes specifically with the Quran's teaching regarding Christ. Another area that we might explore, which the average Westerner finds unbelievably shocking, that is those who have had their moral sensibilities shaped by the Bible, and specifically by New Testament Christianity. They are shocked to find that the Quran advocates polygamy. The definitive passage, Surah 4, verse 3. And if you fear that you will not deal fairly by the orphans, referring specifically to war widows, marry of the women who seem good to you, two or three or four. And if you fear that you cannot do justice to so many, then one only or the captives that your right hands possess. Here is the definitive passage in the Quran that allows a Muslim man to have up to four wives. May I submit to you that that kind of teaching is a degradation of women and the original intent of God Himself with regard to the marriage relationship. We should not be surprised, therefore, as more Muslims have come into our country to see mistreatment of women. For example, did you hear about the New York executive, television station owner, that was upset with his wife because she threatened to divorce him? They found her beheaded. What about the man in Phoenix, a suburb of Phoenix, Arizona, who was upset with his daughter because she was becoming westernized. Consequently, he took his automobile and literally ran her over. Then there was the father in Dallas, Texas, who drove a cab, was upset with his 17 and 18 year old daughters, again, because of the influence of the West upon them at their school. Consequently, he lured them into his cab and shot them both to death. There was a man in Georgia from Pakistan who strangled his 25-year-old daughter because she wanted to get out of an arranged marriage to a man that she had not seen. In St. Louis, Missouri, a couple, newspaper called them fundamentalist Muslims, but I, may I submit to you they were simply going with the Quran. They actually were brought to trial and sentenced to death for killing their 16-year-old daughter, again because of her tendency to be influenced by the West. This has been happening in countries around the United States as well, including Canada, where uh, a man killed three of his daughters and his first wife from his polygamous marriage, again because they were seen as dishonoring the family uh, by not uh, s complying with Islamic thinking with regard to dress and dating and socialization. There was a, a Muslim cleric up in... Uh, Australia that said it's okay for a man to rape his wife. Another man in Australia actually raped a woman as punishment because he caught her reading the Bible. Well, we can fully expect to see and to hear many other such instances because you would expect the fruit of the teaching of the Quran in its dehumanization of women to result in that very thing. Let me show you another passage from Surah 4 which gives us further insight into why women would be treated the way we are seeing them treated. This is Muhammad Pickthall's translation of Surah 4 verse 34. Men are in charge of women because Allah hath made the one of them to excel the other and because they spend of their property for the support of women. So good women are the obedient, guarding in secret that which Allah hath guarded. As for those from whom you fear rebellion, admonish them and banish them to beds apart and scourge them. Then if they obey you, seek not a way against them. Lo, Allah is ever high, exalted, great. That's Muhammad Pickthall, a Muslim scholar. Let me show you another Muslim translation by Abdullah Yusuf Ali in the specific section as to those women on whose part ye fear disloyalty and ill conduct, 
admonish them, he then inserts the word in parentheses first, and then inserts the word next, refuse to share their beds, and last, beat them. And right after that, he inserts the word lightly, which I assure you is not in the Arabic. So here is a passage that teaches that men are to have such control over their wives and women. This this would apply to other women in their circle. That they are fully authorized by the Word of God, according to them, the Quran, to beat their wives, to punish them with physical punishment. Do you know when uh, General George Patton was waging war in North Africa against the famous Nazi general uh, Rommel. He had an opportunity to kind of survey the landscape, the social landscape, and see what Islam had done for those Muslim countries in North Africa. And in his book, War As I Knew It, he made this very pungent, insightful observation. One cannot but ponder the question, What if the Arabs had been Christians? To me, it seems certain that the fatalistic teachings of Muhammad and the utter degradation of women is the outstanding cause for the arrested development of the Arab. He is exactly as he was around the year 700, while we have kept on developing. Here, I think, is a text for some eloquent sermon on the virtues of Christianity. Indeed, Christianity wherever it has gone, has elevated women. Do you remember in the Wild West of America when the men went out there and they had saloons and mountain men, didn't take a bath for months, and finally the women came and built the schools and the churches and closed saloons and brothels? Christianity has empowered women in our culture to elevate the men and to elevate society. That is part and parcel of Christianity. But historically, look back over the corridors of time and see where Islam has gone. Women have been so mistreated that they have not been allowed to fulfill their God-designed role, according to Genesis chapter 2, to be man's uh, uh, appropriate, suitable, fit assistant and helper. In great contrast to Islam, Look at this statement made by one of our founding fathers, Noah Webster, in his incredible volume, History of the United States. He said, To young men, I would recommend that their treatment of females should be always characterized by kindness, delicacy, and respect. We cannot fail to number among the chief temporal advantages of Christianity the elevation of of the female character. Folks, that's part of the foundation of America and that is because America was founded on Christian principles. So shocking as it may be, the Quran openly advocates polygamy. But that's not all. What about violence? Since 9-1-1 have we not been told, even by our own politicians publicly and by Muslim clerics, Oh, this little radical element that's so violent, that does not represent Islam. Islam is a religion of peace. Well, who do you believe? Well, may I suggest to you, don't believe anybody. Go to the Quran and let the Quran speak for itself. Make certain that you have an accurate translation, uh, a, a genuine representation of the Arabic text, and then go with what the Quran says. Question, does the Quran teach violence? Well, read it for yourself. How about Surah 47? Now, when you meet in battle, okay, we could stop right there. The question is answered. When you meet in battle, those who disbelieve, then it is smiting of the necks, that is beheading, until when you have routed them, then making fast of bonds, and afterward either grace or ransom till the war lay down its burdens. That is the ordinance. And if Allah willed, he could have punished them without you. But thus it is ordained that he may try some of you by means of others. And those who are slain in the way of Allah, he renders not their actions vain. That is, they get to go to paradise. What about Surah 2? Fight in the way of Allah against those who fight against you. But begin not hostilities. This is a very early surah in Muhammad's career in which warfare was primarily defensive. Lo, Allah loves not aggressors. Slay them wherever you find them. Drive them out of the places where they drove you out. 
for persecution is worse than slaughter. And fight not with them at the inviolable place of worship, that is at the Kaaba, until they first attack you there. If they attack you there, then kill them. Such is the reward of disbelievers. If they desist, then lo, Allah is forgiving, merciful. But fight them until persecution is no more and religion is for Allah. This is the passage that many commentators say is a blanket statement that indicates that Muslims have a divine obligation to spread Islam around the world, to conquer the entire world, and to subjugate the entire world to Islam. Notice the passage continues. But if they desist, then let there be no hostility except against wrongdoers. The forbidden month for the forbidden month and forbidden things in retaliation. One who attacks you, attack him in like manner as if he attacked you. Observe your duty to Allah. Know that Allah is with those who ward off evil. Did you notice that the Quran says just the opposite of what Jesus said? Jesus said if somebody attacks you, you turn the other cheek. You, you don't retaliate. But the Quran says if he attacks you, you attack him. What a contrast between these two volumes. What about Surah 2 down in verse 216? Warfare... This is God speaking to Muhammad. Warfare is ordained for you, though it is a hateful, though it is hateful unto you, but it may happen that you hate a thing that's good for you. It may happen that you love a thing that is not fighting, which is bad for you. Allah knows, ye know not. They questioned the O Muhammad with regard to warfare in the sacred month. Here's what you're to say. Warfare therein is a great transgression, but lo, to turn men from the way of Allah and to disbelieve in Him in the inviolable place of worship and to expel His people thence is a greater with Allah, for persecution is worse than killing. Two quick comments. Notice that the Quran frequently will say, yeah, it's very wrong to do this, but you need to go ahead and do it under these circumstances. That's typical of a volume that's been authored by a mere man. It doubles back on itself, contradicts itself, finds exceptions for everything that it has already said there are no exceptions for. And secondly, notice again the repeat of the concept that persecution is worse than killing. Think about the, the implications of that. That passage is saying, rather than endure persecution, it would be much better for you to stop the persecution by killing your persecutor. The exact opposite of what Jesus Himself said. What about Surah 22 verse 39? Sanction is given unto those who fight because they've been wronged and Allah is indeed able to give them victory. What about Surah 61 verse 4? Allah loves those who battle for His cause in ranks as if they were a solid structure. I assure you this is not figurative language. This is referring to military ranks that proceed in battle. Here, by the way, is the um, Saudi Arabian flag that has a sword attached as part of it. Notice this passage, Surah 9, freedom from obligation is proclaimed from Allah and His messenger, that is, Muhammad, toward those of the idolaters with whom you made a treaty. Historically, this is talking specifically about some treaties that Muhammad made. Travel freely in the land four months and know that you cannot escape Allah, that Allah will confound the disbelievers in His guidance. And a proclamation from Allah and His Messenger to all men on the day of the greater pilgrimage, that's the annual pilgrimage to Mecca, that Allah is free from obligation to the idolaters and so is His Messenger, that is Muhammad. So if you repent, it will be better for you. But if you are versed, then know that you cannot escape Allah. Glad tidings, O Muhammad, of a painful doom to those who disbelieve, excepting those of the idolaters with whom you Muslims have a treaty and who have since abated nothing of your right nor have supported anyone against you. As for these, fulfill their treaty to them till their term. Lo, Allah loves those who keep their duty unto Him. Then, when the sacred months have passed, Slay the idolaters wherever you find them. Take them captive, besiege them, prepare for them each ambush. If they repent and establish worship and pay the poor due, then leave their way free. Lo, Allah is forgiving and merciful. Let's move on to Surah 9. Fight against such of those who have been given the Scripture. That would be Jews and or Christians. 
as believe not in Allah nor the last day, and forbid not that which Allah hath forbidden by His Messenger, and follow not the religion of truth, until they pay the tribute readily, being brought low. It was standard for Muslims at this period to place conquered Jews and Christians under tribute. They had to pay tax because they had not embraced Islam. What about these scattered verses from Surah 8? And fight them until persecution is no more and religion is all for Allah. If thou comest on them in the war, deal with them as to strike fear in those who are behind them. Notice the battle strategy. If you can get the front lines to break in fear and run, that will unnerve the rear ranks and cause them to run as well. This is very specific battle strategy. Let not those who disbelieve, disbelieve suppose that they can outstrip Allah's purpose. Lo, they cannot escape. Make ready for them all thou canst of armed force and of horses tethered. Uh, move on down. O prophet, exhort the believers to fight. If there be of you 20 steadfast, they can overcome 200. If there be of you 100 steadfast, they shall overcome 1,000 of those who disbelieve because they, the disbelievers, are a folk without intelligence. It's not for any prophet to have captives until he hath made slaughter in the land. If you were to turn to Muslim commentators and have them explain to you this particular surah, they would tell you that there was a battle, if I remember right, the Battle of Badr. And uh, Muhammad spared some of these individuals that had battled against them, spared their lives. His cohort said, Muhammad, you shouldn't have done that. These are the very people who ran us out of Mecca. And so he was being rebuked by his fellow Muslims, and here he received this uh, revelation from God, which did the same thing. God chastising him for taking prisoners instead of showing them no quarter and killing all of them. What about Surah 47? Therefore, when you meet the unbelievers in fight, smite at their necks. Where did Muslims get the idea? We've seen all of this beheading going on. It comes straight from the Quran. But those who are slain in the way of Allah, He will never let their deeds be lost. Soon will He guide them and improve their condition and admit them to the garden. That is to paradise. That, in fact, is the Arabic word for paradise, garden. Look how many passages we have here. Passage after passage after passage that identifies violence and warfare and bloodshed as that which Muhammad engaged in, that which God commanded him to engage in, that which Muslims at large engaged in, and yet we're told, oh no, the Quran does not advocate violence, it is a religion of peace. How about Surah 3, beginning in 156? O ye who believe, be not as those who disbelieve and said of their brethren who went abroad in the land or were fighting in the field. If they had been here with us, they would not have died or been killed. What? Though ye be slain in Allah's way or die therein, surely pardon from Allah and mercy are better than all that they amass. What? Though you be slain or die, when unto Allah you are gathered, So those who fought and were slain, verily I shall remit their evil deeds from them, and verily I shall bring them into gardens underneath which rivers flow, a reward from Allah. Muslim commentators tell us this historically refers specifically to an incident where the Muslim army marched out of camp. However, some did not go. Muhammad noticed that but said nothing. When they returned, and a number of Muslims did not return, they had been killed in battle, those Muslims who stayed in the camp said, see, if you all had not gone and done that, we wouldn't have lost all these men. And yet, Muhammad claims to have gotten this revelation in which God says, what, you have a problem with going and dying for Allah when you get to go to paradise? So here is a very clear surah that advocates the propriety of killing. Here is a standard Muslim response. Oh, the fighting that the Quran advocates and describes and permits is strictly defensive. They were just defending themselves. Well, there's no question that especially early in Muhammad's career, there was some defensive warfare. But to suggest that all of the hostilities and fighting that the Quran speaks of is strictly defensive is simply not true. The various uh, Muslim Scholars and commentators will admit in their sober moments that, that as a matter of fact, for example, this uh, Diobandi 
Pakistan's Supreme Court Sharia judge for, for some 20 years indicated that uh, Muslims should wage aggressive military jihad to establish the supremacy of Islam. And that means then they should live peacefully in countries like Britain where they have freedom to practice Islam only until they gain enough power to engage in battle. That has been the standard viewpoint of Muslim commentators through the centuries. Did you know that the term jihad is used 40 times in the Quran? 36 of those times it's clearly referring to killing or subjugating infidels in holy war. Let's back up just a moment and remind ourselves. Remember, Muslim commentators and scholars freely admit that Muhammad himself personally led 27 military campaigns and planned or authorized 38 additional ones that in Medina he eliminated Jewish tribal opposition by agreeing to the execution of numbers of Jewish men. And since that time, through the centuries, Muslim armies have conquered nations across North Africa into Europe, east to India, southeast Asia, Indonesia, north to Turkey, and northeast deep into Asia and all the way up to Russia. Muslim armies were stopped in their advance at the Pyrenees Mountains by uh, Martel. Otherwise, they would have continued right on in to Europe itself. And you want to tell me that all of these Muslim um, victories and all of this Muslim extension and all of these countries that have been conquered for Islam, all of that was defensive warfare? I think not. May I suggest to you, based upon our analysis, not of hearsay, what this person claims or that person claims, but strictly an analysis of the Quran, seeing what it teaches, comparing it with the Bible, comparing it with what has happened in history, we are forced to conclude Islam and Christianity are in irreparable conflict. The Quran and the Bible contradict each other. The Quran teaches, it openly advocates, Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. No such thing as crucifixion. He was not crucified. No such thing as Trinity. No, no necessity for blood atonement. And it forthrightly advocates polygamy and violence. In our final session together, I would like for us to pause and look back over our own history as a nation and answer this question. What was the attitude of the founders of the American Republic toward Islam. If you appreciate this seminar on Islam and the Quran, you will want to read the book on which it was based, The Quran Unveiled. This volume gives a great deal of additional information not included in the DVD seminar. Also available are study guides that supplement your viewing of the DVD. The study guides, the book, as well as additional copies of the DVD may all be purchased at apologeticspress.org or by calling toll-free 800-234-8558.